Hello, this is co-chair Ruth Richardson. Pursuant to House Rule 10.01, I call this remote meeting of the Select Committee on Racial Justice to order. I just want to ver verify with uh, staff on record that we indeed have a quorum. We do have a quorum, Chair Richardson. Thank you. So we'll move on to the approval of the minutes from October 6th. Uh, Vice Chair Damoth, have you had a chance to review the minutes? Um, actually, the minutes from October 13th, um, excuse me. Have you had a chance to review those minutes from October 13th? I have, uh, Chair Richardson, thank you. I would move that we would approve the minutes from October 13th. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion prevails and the minutes are adopted. Uh, before we move into today's hearing, I did just want to take a moment to recognize uh, one of our staff members who are moving on. Um, I wanted to thank Benta Kanta for all of her uh, work on this committee and all of her work leading up to the formation of the House Select Committee on Racial Justice. She was uh, a key uh, person in terms of drafting the House uh, resolution, and she will definitely be missed. Uh, thank you, Benta, for all of your service uh, on this committee and with the House, and we wish you all the best as you are, as you are moving on. So, thank you, Chair Richardson. Thank you. <laughs> So uh, members, this is our last hearing of this series of weekly hearings. Uh, today, we're gonna be focusing on the economic costs of systemic racism. This is really important information because when we talk about demanding an end to systemic racism and a remedy for its harmful legacy, it's not just a, a moral question or a moral imperative, but it's also an economic one as well. Systemic racism is expensive and continuing to promote the status quo, denying its existence or refusing to confront it leads to a less prosperous country and a less prosperous Minnesota. I think at this point, all members have received the research from uh, Citibank. And if you haven't had an opportunity to look at that, uh, that research study, I highly encourage you to do so. Uh, city research estimates that the US economy lost $16 trillion and an estimated 6.1 million jobs were not generated over the last 20 years as a result of discrimination against African Americans in areas including housing, education, and access to business loans. The power of this committee is that we are not just here to admire the problems or focus on passive statements. Rather, we are gathering concrete recommendations for consideration. The formation of this committee through bipartisan efforts was just a first step and a call to action to acknowledge systemic racism exists, to understand and measure how communities have been impacted historically and today, and to set forth bold recommendations to start the long overdue work of eradicating systemic racism through meaningful community engagement, including with those closest to the pain of these issues. We're at a critical point and it's up to all of us to meet this moment to move towards building a Minnesota where all have the opportunity to meet their full potential. Last week, we had over 60 people sign up to provide public testimony and many more submitted written recommendations. We understand that we were under pretty significant time constraints with the number of testifiers that we had. So we are going to continue to accept written testimony and recommendations from the public until October. October 27th, 2020. Uh, these public submissions should be directed to our committee administrators, uh, Laura or Alyssa. Members are also encouraged to reach out with recommendations as well if there are any that you would want to share with the committee during that time period. Uh, in terms of next steps, we anticipate convening a small working group to compile the recommendations submitted by the public, uh, by testifiers, and by members in order to work towards putting forward a slate of recommendations to be considered by the full committee. So now we're going to uh, jump into our 
uh, informational hearing today. And before we hear from Dr. Uh, Bruce Corey, we had a, uh, a brief uh, documentary that we just wanted to show a clip from. This is courtesy of Twin Cities Public Television, who has uh, authorized us to show this uh, brief clip on Jim Crow of the North. <laughs> This mob of over a hundred people marched on an African American's house in October of 1909 to try to stop this family from moving in. of Minneapolis, as the newspaper called them, these are not the kind of people who want to be involved in mob violence. And they don't have to, because they have other tools that they can use. And there's this tool that they become aware of. It's called a racial covenant. And so just a few months after this confrontation, you see the first racial covenant appear in a Minneapolis property. And this is where you first see this racial language. Caucasians only, Aryans only, no Negroes or no members of African blood or descent. 100% of them were aimed at black people. In many ways, racial covenants, this is kind of ground zero of residential segregation. And the United States and racism have a very, very long history, but this particular deployment of racism is fairly new, and this idea was really made material through instruments like racial covenants. The law of the streets, the law of the courts working in consort to discourage blacks from moving into white neighborhoods. It starts out as private property developers, but eventually you have the federal government encouraging these racial covenants, demanding actually that any investment they make is protected with this kind of racial exclusivity. covenant entire areas of the city, it makes it off limits, that's pretty powerful. This is Jim Crow of the North. century, it would seem that Minnesota was one of the most enlightened states with regard to race. You had a leadership of the state that seemed much more uh, amenable to doing the right thing, or at least uh, supporting in word policies that uh, respected the dignity of the African American. Frank Wheaton came from Maryland. Wheaton came to Minnesota. He saw opportunity out here. He already had a law degree when he entered the law school at the university. And when he got out, he had aspirations for political advancement. He understood how to establish a rapport with the party apparatus. And as a result of their support, he was able to win an election in South Minneapolis with a constituency made up of white and immigrant voters. He authored two bits of legislation that dealt with civil rights, public accommodations. The Civil Rights Bill, the Accommodations Bill, only dealt with blacks not being discriminated against in terms of going to restaurants, hotels, riding in streetcars, the railroads, places like that. It didn't really deal with other issues like schools and, and housing and things of that nature. But for all intents and purposes, it was a major step forward with regard to civil rights. 
1910, Minneapolis isn't particularly segregated. There is emerging African-American neighborhoods around Lake Harriet, around West River Road, certainly on the east side of Minneapolis. Prospect Park is this beautiful neighborhood, very close to downtown, very close to the University of Minnesota, right on the banks of the Mississippi River. It was a very desirable neighborhood, and I think neighbors weren't surprised when they saw a house that fit into this neighborhood on what is now East Franklin Avenue. Madison Jackson, he was a guy who had a law degree, but he was a Pullman porter. He moved his family to Prospect Park, and he built a house there. This was the first black family there. My father had bought a piece of land in what is known as Prospect Park, Minneapolis, and he broke ground to build the house in which I grew up. Until the house was nearly completed, the completely white community did not realize that a black family was moving in. And when we moved in, the whole community became quite aroused that a black family should be moving in. Marvel Jackson, she said, when the neighbors across the street saw who they were, she said that lady started screaming when she realized that it was an African-American family that was moving in across the street from her. I was seven, so I remember them. Meetings on our lawn as to why we could not live there. When my father and mother wouldn't budge, they had committees come to meet them. And I remember sitting on the steps listening to some of the things that were said. For instance, one of the things, our children will not play with your children. And my father was hadn't thought about the impact on the children. My father built us a playground like there was no other like it in the in the whole area. And we became the most popular children in the place. The um, neighbors couldn't keep their children away. A little while after they moved in, the father's friend and co-worker also wanted to build a house in the neighborhood. William and Daisy Simpson, they were going to build a house as well. And they were staying in the Jackson house while their house was under construction. And I think that was the tipping point. And that's when the resistance from white homeowners really ramped up. And this is where the Tribune reports a race war in Prospect Park. This mob of over 100 people. The newspaper described it as some of the most powerful people in Minneapolis marched on the Jackson House in October of 1909. They read prepared statements. It was decided that a large delegation should call upon you to make doubly impressive a fact, namely, that the white residents of this district do not want members of your race domiciled in our midst. We are not here to argue, but to make a perfectly plain statement of our position in the matter to wit, that we do not want you. And as men of prudence, judgment, and determination, we will do everything we can to prevent this. And then there was another threat. Rumors have been brought to our attention that there are parties in this vicinity who are determined that you and those of your race shall not reside in this district. That they have firmly declared themselves ready to take any steps necessary to bring about your removal. And you have to understand, in 1909, this is a period where lynchings are commonplace. These were not idle threats. The amazing thing to me is that both of these families persisted. They stayed in their houses. The Simpsons built a lovely home, which is still there today. Marvel blazed a trail. She was the first African-American child to go through Pratt Elementary School. I learned that her mother had actually dated W.E.B. Du Bois before marrying Madison Jackson. That gives me clues as to what that household must have been like. As soon as they became teenagers, all those white friends she had basically abandoned her. At that time, I determined I was going to get out of that kind of society and go where my people were. 
she went to the University of Minnesota where she dated Roy Wilkins and was engaged to him briefly. As soon as she finished at the University of Minnesota, she got out of Minneapolis. Her parents had protected her, I think, from a lot of the racism in her childhood. But when you get to be a grown up, you certainly can experience this more. And she realized there was really no place for her here. Well, Minneapolis's loss was the Harlem Renaissance gain. She ended up moving to New York City. She ended up working for W.E.B. Du Bois. She ended up becoming one of the premier African-American journalists in the country. And then she became one of the first black journalists to work for an all-white publication. So she has this incredible career, incredible talents, gifts, passion, and Minneapolis lost her. Madison Jackson died in 1927. Once he died and they sold the house, both families left Minneapolis. And I just wonder what it would have been like, you know, if they had been welcomed. You know, if Prospect Park had become an enclave for black intellectuals and black civil rights activists, what would that have been like? How would the city be different? And that's what I think about a lot when I think about this story. The problem with the Madison Jackson and William Simpson incident is people had to show up in their front yard and threaten them. And this was in 1909. I don't think it's any coincidence that in May of 1910, the first racial covenant shows up in South Minneapolis. I'm pretty sure I know who wrote that covenant, and that was one Edmund G. Walton. He was a real estate developer. legacy he left on Minneapolis. I mean, there's Edmund Boulevard, there's all these additions with his last name. Really, probably the most important and the worst was this legacy of racial covenants. So when people purchase a home, traditionally you get an abstract package. And it shows every time your property, the property that you've just purchased, changed hands. And in Minneapolis, properties that were platted after 1910 are very likely to have these racial restrictions embedded in the property deed. Covenants can be building covenants. They can be setback requirements. But the racial covenants that we're concerned with tells you who can or cannot live, lease, even occupy certain spaces racially restrictive covenants, private contracts between individuals that allow them to dictate to whom they'll sell their property. Identifying racial covenants, however, has proved remarkably challenging. The only way to find racial covenants are to read warranty deeds. We're looking at about 3 million deeds in Hennepin County between 1900 and 1960, and each deed on average runs about three pages. So we're in the ballpark of 10 million or so uh, pages of text. Penny found about 4,000, 5,000 racial covenants by herself. The old-fashioned way, she just went down to the uh, county recorder's office and started going through deeds. And she found several thousand racially restrictive covenants. And that was enough to get us thinking, okay, hey, you know, maybe we can do more than just show that racial covenants were a practice that was used in Minneapolis. What if we can map all of them? The first map that Penny made was shocking. I was shocked when I saw this. And I was shocked when she started reading me some of the language of these, uh, of these racial covenants. The wording can be very different. They're working on early 20th century ideas of race. Chinese, Japanese, Negro, Moorish, Turkish, Mongolian, Hebrew, sometimes Semitic. People of African blood or descent. No Negroes or Jews. Only Caucasians except for their domestic servants of a different race who might be domiciled with the owner. Many of them were written during the period where eugenics is at front and center of American scientific thought, and that language is often what you see in these deeds. Only people of the Aryan race can inhabit this land. Or the Aryan branch of the Caucasian race. I think one of the surprising things that I found in this research is 100% of these covenants are aimed at African Americans. Oh, there's that, that's black. Okay, here's the legal description. 
what we're doing with Mapping Prejudice is we're using digital tools to do a lot of the heavy lifting to help us identify the deeds that do contain racially restrictive covenants. Covenants exist across the country. People say, well, why aren't you doing this for St. Paul, too? I know there are covenants in St. Paul. Their deeds are not scanned. Which is incredibly unwieldy, right? For traditional research methods where you go down to the archive and you just start going through the material, um, you would need an army of undergrads and the better part of a century. And even then, I'm not convinced you'd be able to uh, be able to get through all of them. So we use OCR to translate these digitized warranty deeds into searchable text documents. Once we have these in text document form, I can write a script that iterates through and looks for predefined racial terms. And whenever it finds a match, we flag this corresponding deed image. And once we have this into the still very large but manageable realm of, you know, around 40,000 flagged images, we ask volunteers to help us transcribe them. And it says, may not be sold, mortgaged, or leased to or occupied by any person or persons other than members oh. of the Caucasian race. Yeah. Yep. Okay. So you can go ahead and click yes. And those answers I then export, and this actually gives me enough data to build the map. intentional space has always been intentionally manufactured to shape and represent values the question is whose values and for whom's benefit and I'd argue historically low-income folks of color in particular and you know larger racial and ethnic groups more broadly have not been at the center of the benefits of urban planning the covenants were first put in in 1910 but at that point Developers could start buying up large sections of farmland that adjoin the city. When a developer buys what used to be a farm on the outskirts of town, they buy it, divide it into six city lots, and sell the individual lots off. At that point, when they start selling off the individual lots, that's really when their racial covenant is kind of injected um, into the property record. So people like Samuel Thorpe, Thorpe Brothers, could buy this up and just plat it and lay it out as they saw fit and put in covenants. It was a very efficient way of doing this. There's this real estate convention. It's there that J.C. Nichols, who runs the country club estates in Kansas City, gets up and said, a few years ago, I was really hesitant, but now I can't sell a property without them. And Sam Thorpe was certainly there. He was a retiring president. He comes back and in August of 1912, buys up the land that will become Thorpe Brothers Nokomis Terrace. And that is the first fully covenanted edition that I know of. It talks about no colored people or other objectionable types. Mary Greer was a woman who inherited many of the Dorman edition properties near West River Road. And after 1910, she started putting in racial covenants that will never be sold or transferred or leased or conveyed to anyone who's a Negro. And that goes for people who are living with Negroes or married to Negroes. She adopted that early on. Her first one shows up about 1911 or 12. And you see this all through the teens and 20s with her. And Edmund Walton did the same thing along West River Road. At one point, I think they said he had bought up 437 acres along the river. He had gone in 1910 from sort of surreptitiously putting these covenants in, not recording them. Less than a decade later, he was bragging about them in the newspaper. There was an ad, and he printed the covenant, which shows you how quickly they were accepted. Supreme Court even held that restrictive covenants were constitutional. This was in the case of Corrigan v. Buckley, and it was in that decision where the court resolved that restrictive covenants are contracts, 
and as such, they are lawful. Now forget about the fact that they discriminate and forget about the fact that once we say these contracts exist, we are, we are bringing up a violation issue of the 14th Amendment. Forget about that. The key thing is that the Supreme Court validated segregation, validated discrimination. You have the full force of the law, the court system, um, determining who could go where. And what will happen as a result of that is you'll see efforts to ensure that a denial to one of the most basic foundations of, of opportunity for African Americans will be codified in the United States as a result. You had not only the courts supporting it, but also a kind of license of sorts of people going to the streets and harassing blacks who moved into white neighborhoods. White neighbors, knowing that the Francis couple was moving in, offered them money to not move into the house. William Francis and his wife Nellie, who is one of my heroes, rejected that and moved in and as a result faced all kinds of harassment. The Francis family did not live there for very long because shortly after moving in, William T. Francis was appointed to be uh, the consul to Liberia, in effect an ambassador, and so they, they moved to Africa. It's an example of how even the most prominent of African Americans in Minnesota at the time, who had established contacts with some of the most powerful people in American politics, Nellie herself had personal audiences with Andrew Carnegie and three U.S. presidents that despite their successes and their, their influence uh, could still be uh, exposed to racial animus. So it, it shows the intensity of, of property values, the perception of property values and race. So what racial covenants did is they hardened boundaries. They hardened these invisible racial boundaries. It's interesting because even in neighborhoods where there maybe aren't any covenants, just being in proximity to covenants is really powerful for keeping that neighborhood white still. Homes are often taken for granted for some of us. Instances like the Lee family faced makes us realize that a home is a kind of fragile thing. It's a, a one and a half story, quite modest bungalow. You, you wouldn't particularly notice it, but when you know anything about its history and the story of the Lee family, um, it becomes quite powerful. Arthur Lee was a World War I vet. He worked for the post office. He had a good, steady paycheck at a time when 30% of the city is out of work. So he finds this house that someone is willing to sell him on 46th and Columbus. It was not covenanted. They had a temerity to violate what is, at that point, this boundary in the urban landscape. So Arthur Lee, he moves into the house. You know, first the Neighborhood Association gets together and they try to buy him out. They contact the bank, they contact different lawyers, they try legal means. In July of 1931, by newspaper reports, five or 6,000 white people at any given time are milling around his house trying to drive him out. Black paint was thrown on their house. Their dog is poisoned. Vandalism, intimidation. The family has to sleep in the basement. They had the sense that they had set these boundaries, that no one was to violate them. This is just a, another tool, so to speak, this citizen terrorism. And in this particular case, Arthur, who was a World War I vet, right, comes home to believe that his service to our country gave him the same access as his white counterparts, but learned very quickly that that was not the case.
it was really important for families like the Lee family to have advocates to help them fight. Being able to have lawyers like Lena Olive Smith and being able to have the NAACP on their side was really powerful in, in making sure that their voices were heard. The NAACP was definitely fighting against these racial covenants and these instances of racial housing discrimination. There was also smaller clubs and organizations that were really focused on fighting this. Unfortunately, even with all of these legal protections and organizations fighting for them, a lot of people don't end up getting the end result that they want. Edith and Arthur Lee and their daughter Mary, they stayed for two years. They didn't, they didn't make it longer than two years. I think, I think the pressure was just too great for them. I can only imagine as a parent, as someone who wants to ensure that I'm living my values, like what it would mean to put my family at risk, um, what it would mean to always feel like I'm looking over my shoulder um, just to protect my right. You have this escalation of this sense of threat thanks to racial covenants. So it's that intensification, that normalization of these racist ideas that leads to the Lee House. The marker at the corner of the property has a depiction, an image of Arthur Lee. For those who just walk by, I think it gets them, it gets them thinking about it. contented family life. And now, through the use of a National Housing Act insured mortgage, is brought within the reach of all citizens on a monthly payment In the midst of the New Deal, when the FDR administration is looking for ways to try to stabilize the housing market, the Fair Housing Act is passed in 1934. And as part of that, the Homeowners Loan Corporation is also established with the hope that if you could establish long-term mortgages with fixed interest rates, you could create pathways to home ownership for most Americans. This time, they can buy this house with monthly payments that are less than they now spend for rent. When the FHA starts underwriting mortgages in the 1930s, this really is a game changer in a lot of ways. It takes a lot of risk off the banks, it places it onto the federal government, and now working class, middle class families, they're able to purchase a, a home. Unfortunately, as part of that, which, what the HOLC does is it establishes uh, designations for neighborhoods based on the occupants of those neighborhoods. And this is where the term redlining comes into place. FHA, they made color-coded maps of all the largest cities in the United States, and they broke cities down into four different areas. Red is considered hazardous, that's the worst. Yellow is considered definitely declining. Blue is considered still desirable. And green is considered the best. And what's so powerful about this kind of scale of measuring investment, it was about values and people. The fact of the matter is that there was no evidence that those people who lived in those communities, pr predominantly black and brown people and foreign-born people, would have defaulted on loans. There are no firm realities behind the close proximity to blackness in your property values going down. That's just not true. The FHA is being very upfront and very explicit in how they are linking spatial desirability with racial occupancy. It's this racialization of space idea. So areas that were predominantly uh, African-American or majority minority or really, in a lot of cases, even if there's a few non-white people there, that's often enough to be redlined. So when they built these maps, they also explained why each area got the ranking it did. The area around 4th Avenue South, which is called the Old South Side, this was a nice area. It had nice homes. It's the historic African-American neighborhood on the south side of Minneapolis. This one part of South Minneapolis was redlined specifically due to, and I'm quoting, a gradual infiltration of Negroes and Asiatics. The FHA refused to give an area a green-lined designation. Again, this is the best designation that they'll, they'll offer unless, and I'm quoting again, restrictive covenants are already in place. That line's from the FHA underwriting manual. 
racial covenants aren't just about discriminating against people of color. It's about enriching white people. And I think that's the part that often gets lost in this narrative. And I think it does speak to the ways that white supremacy have been embedded in really built structures and built environments. I mean, if your grandparents bought a home on Minnehaha Creek, you know, that home's worth, what, half a million? If your grandparents rented an area that was redlined and then subsequently destroyed by a freeway project, you know, you're not inheriting anything. In a lot of ways, the practice of redlining, which didn't start until the 1930s, institutionalized and spread racial covenants all over the country because suddenly developers got sanctioned, they got direction from the federal government saying, this is best practices if you want to have a really high rating from us, if you want to get the most favorable terms for any loans. By kind of de-integrating Minneapolis, which in many ways is what racial covenants are doing, this set the stage and enabled all these subsequent systems of inequality to really take and to really take hold. This very persistent myth that northern cities never had formal segregation. The South had Jim Crow, and look at those signs. Well, racial covenants did the work of Jim Crow in, in the North, all over the North. Many. So we are going to stop the, the clip there, but I do want members to know that if you're interested in viewing more of the documentary, it's available free through Twin Cities Public Television and their website. And so encourage you to um, uh, go there if you're interested in, in viewing more. We thought this would be an important um, sort of uh, um, opening to today's topic on the economic costs of, of racism, because some of those terms are going to be coming up in the next uh, presentation. And so with that, I would like to recognize, um, oh, and also right now in the chat, uh, staff has put the full documentary link as well. So feel free to access that. Um, now I'd like to recognize uh, today's uh, testifier, Dr. Bruce Corey. Thank you so much for agreeing to uh, come in and testify on the economic uh, cost of racism. I will let you do your uh, own uh, introduction. And members, uh, if you are interested in asking a question during the presentation, we may take questions uh, during the presentation, depending upon how things are going. Just use the raise your hand signal and that will be a cue for me to call on you. Dr. Corey, um, please introduce yourself and you then have the floor. Uh, good, good morning, uh, Bruce Corey. I am a, a professor of economics at Concordia University and also a member of the Alana Community Brain Trust, Alana standing for African, Latino, Asian, and Native American. Uh, it's uh, seeing snow across my window as I speak. Uh, it, this is the right time to talk about issues like this. Um, uh, by way of background, I mean, uh, when I was listening to the video, uh, it reminded me about my close friend uh, that when I moved to Minnesota 30 years ago, an African-American uh, lady who would go to St. Peter Claver Church that I attend, her name was Grandma Wilson, I called her. Uh, she died at about 104. And she, she reminded me about this incredible strength of the human spirit that has the ability to transcend world wars and civil wars and civil rights. And, and, and she always had that optimistic uh, Frame and a lot of, and she lived in the Rondo area where her, she lost her home and had to move closer to the church. So a lot of that experience influenced my own thinking about um, economic development. I, uh, uh, in terms of uh, some background about me, I, uh, Governor Ventura uh, appointed me to chair the Working Group on Minority Business Development in 2000, yes, 2000, uh, where we produced the first statewide report on the uh, power of minority businesses. We had statewide hearings, including in reservations, and we compiled a report on recommendations. And, and the report was also noted for uh, portraying uh, the uh, minority uh, communities as assets. And uh, through these years, I've been documenting the economic contributions of immigrants and minorities. Most recently was the Director of Planning and Economic Development of the City of St. Paul. And listening to the, the, the video, uh, I appointed the first uh, uh, Minority uh, Director of Planning and the Mer Director of uh, Housing 
uh, for the city of St. Paul and its history. Uh, I worked with community groups to establish this model of economic development uh, that views uh, the Alana communities as assets and it could be seen in cultural destination areas like Little Africa, Little Mekong. And, uh, and so I wanna bring some of these ideas and thoughts uh, to your attention. First talking about the Minnesota paradox, uh, then talking about the Minnesota solution and some recommendations. So that's kind of the outline of what I'll be taking. So the Minnesota paradox was first coined by uh, Dr. Samuel Myers of the Humphrey Institute. And he talked about this coexistence of a very high quality progressive politics, innovative program, a state that's welcoming, having a diverse economy and coexisting with it some of the worst racial disparities, especially for black Minnesotans. And so what he, uh, his analysis was, we have all these great programs, but because they failed to integrate uh, the, 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 the reality of racist structures and institutions, uh, it leads to failures of these programs. And so uh, in my opinion, racism is not only a public health crisis, racism is also an economic chokehold on the Alana communities as you saw in the video. And uh, I can show you in some of these practices and patterns that happens in different areas. For instance, in housing, uh, minorities, Alana communities pay higher interest rates uh, and all of these are documented in studies. Uh, for mortgages or denied at a higher rate. Uh, they are steered to locations that are not uh, so uh, uh, valuable. This practice of redlining, they are found to pay higher property taxes. Uh, and when they sell the house, their houses are appraised at a lower value. And the end result is the kid living in poor quality housing and this intergenerational transfer of wealth uh, does not occur. Uh, the maps that you saw on the video, uh, not only of Minneapolis, but there are maps about St. Paul and Rochester and Duluth. So you have the statewide uh, ways in which uh, housing discrimination occurred. In the area of education, uh, you find uh, we, we start with underfunded schools and poor preparation in schools, leading to remedial college education, and the student has to pay for those remedial college classes. And these things add to their debt. Uh, they end up in academic majors that are not uh, very career uh, and high paying careers and they do not have enough uh, uh, support systems in the institutions and a cultural intelligent learning environment. And, and so you end up with delayed graduation, late graduation or not gra graduation at all. And those who do graduate are stuck in low paying jobs with high debt. Business areas, you find a lot of minority businesses, Alana businesses, that are starting up, uh, there's a good burst of energy for various reasons, a past experience, uh, uh, their um, assets, uh, but also uh, discrimination in the workplace that pushes them into entrepreneurship. Uh, in the area of finance, they run into problems of access to capital, they rely more on personal sources of funding. And so this lower capital has impacts on their business. They do not have the access to the contracts and the customers and the networks that help them to grow and expand their business. And then rules and regulations tend to act as a barrier to their growth. Um, some of these rules and regulations that, uh, that are not really um, uh, important in terms of safety and, and uh, of the customer, for example. And then the end result is that uh, most of these business on average are about 183,000 versus 1.4 million in other businesses in Minnesota. Uh, there was a lot of testimony uh, last uh, in the last week about uh, health and issues, and it reminded me of my PhD research where I looked at the impact of economic policies and programs on child survival and development. So if you could start from maternal health and economic assets is one of the most critical uh, factors in, in child survival and development. and then the economic assets of the household, such as income and wealth, uh, these translate into housing, sanitation, nutrition, and healthcare, basically the child's physiological environment. And then compacted on these are the social systems, whether it's race, class, gender, religion, attitudes, and beliefs. And all these factors in very complex ways ultimately impact on the education, health, and nutrition, and cognitive abilities of children especially children of the poor. 
looking statewide, we see these disparities documented by deed statistics in unemployment rates, in uh, uh, coexisting with uh, uh, with uh, significant presence of of Alana workforces and uh, workers in these areas, and the fact that many of the businesses are reporting that they do not hire, uh, they have not hired uh, Alana people in the in the workplaces uh, for whatever reason, but the disparity is just all across uh, Minnesota. Then there are numerous reports, including the one that I uh, helped co-author in 2000 on the economic con uh, contribution of minority businesses. There's the Minnesota Equity Blueprint, the Twin Cities Economic Inclusion Plan, all of them having some really good recommendations, all of them uh, basically gathering dust. There are two very uh, important tools in the government's uh, toolkit uh, to grow Alana businesses, state statute 16C, where 25% of all public spending is targeted to small and minority businesses, and HUD section three that is a very effective strategy for low-income uh, people from low-income backgrounds to get jobs and business opportunities and to grow in uh, as these investments happening in HUD-related projects. Uh, but the track record in all of this has not been very much. For instance, I looked at a Deloitte study 2013 and compared to some of the recommendations we brought out in our 2003 report, a 2000 report on minority business development, and a lot of them were still not implemented. Uh, looking at existing uh, utilization of uh, Alana businesses in, in uh, state procurement, uh, the numbers are unfortunately are not very much higher than what I found in 2000. And uh, a very surprising statistic that uh, there's zero utilization in many of these programs that need uh, to in integrate section three uh, kinds of regulations. And you heard Pastor Newell in his testimony last uh, week uh, talking about this. So all of this uh, ultimately has an impact, ultimately has a cost uh, of these racial dispar disparities. They, they, they act as an economic chokehold on, on the uh, Alana communities. Black earns 71 cents on the dollar uh, um, compared to whites, Native American 68, seven, 68 cents, Latino 70 cents, Asians 94 cents, 53% uh, gap in ho home ownership between blacks and whites, a 21% gap in the 60 year graduation rates between blacks and whites. And as I mentioned to you, the smaller size of a typical uh, Alana minority firm. Aggregate all of this, it comes up to about 287 billion, 22 billion lost in income, uh, 171 central billion lost in lifetime earnings, a 67 billion uh, gap in this business revenue if they were bigger, uh, 24 billion loss in home ownership, reduced rent payments, lower property taxes. You add them all, and that's a sizable impact which is greater than the, again, the GDPs of many countries too, 287 billion uh, combined loss in Alana income, assets and lifetime, lifetime earnings. And the state also loses in at least $2 billion in extra annual taxes that the state could, uh, could receive for programs. Nationally, as uh, Representative Richardson uh, documented, the city study, documents that closing the black wage gap would add 2.7 trillion uh, in income or 0.2% of GDP. Uh, the closing the housing gap would add uh, 770,000 black homeowners. Closing the education gap would increase lifetime earnings up to 113 billion. And closing the entrepreneurship gap would add 13 trillion in business revenue. Intergenerational, using big data, the uh, economist at Harvard, Shetty, he uh, has done some phenomenal study found in opportunityinsights.org on this website, where you can even find Minnesota data. But in this particular illustration, if you take a black uh, kid in a, in a wealthy household and a white kid in a similar wealthy household, you find that the mobility is uh, significantly less for the black kid for all these different reasons that come in play in preventing success. The COVID uh, pandemic uh, was a, a severe blow to the communities. 
uh, in business and in, in, in workforce, high, uh, maybe about 36 to 38 percent of, of uh, the Alana workforce applied for unemployment un insurance. Uh, businesses were hard hit. The, we all know about the disparate uh, way in which uh, uh, the health statistics are showing up for COVID patients. And uh, uh, we, uh, uh, this is combined again with the civil unrest that caused massive destruction to economic assets. And this economic decline that's happening in the economy tends to be in sectors where the Alana communities are dominant. For instance, that uh, 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 sectors that you cannot work from home are not teleworkable. And sectors like retail and hospitality where large segments are employed and taken a big hit. So with all these combination of factors hitting in the community, this economic chokehold. hold what kind of solutions can we offer? And, and, and we call it the Minnesota solution of shared sustainable prosperity. Shared, uh, this is a very un, uh, deep value in Minnesota around a welcoming and sharing community, building the common good. Sustainable in both uses of the word, uh, in terms of the environment and in terms of sustainable investment and prosperity, meaning improved standard of living for all Minnesotans. And so the Minnesota solution uh, has to uh, apply at many levels from fundamentally changing perceptions of how we use the Alana communities uh, to uh, a people-centered approach, measuring and assessing projects and policies and how they impact people, especially the most vulnerable, uh, uh, utilizing cultural intelligence to you know, institution programs and resources uh, and empowering the individual and the community to transform their own destination and transform institutions and, and sustained investments that are going to make this possible. So let me go to some of these ideas, uh, talking about changing perception. One of the big ways to change perception is to look at the community differently. You know, um, 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 uh, perceptions matter. When when one of my family was uh, uh, about to go to surgery, uh, I usually go to the hospital dressed like I am right now with my suit uh, for obvious reasons. And so just before the surgery, I asked to see the anesthesiologist and the person came up to me and one of the first things that he asked me was, uh, are you an attorney? Uh, so perceptions matter, the way we deal with, with situations and so we have to perceive our Alana communities as assets and think about as a policymaker that you are a steward of a 1.4 trillion economy that's bigger than some of the biggest economies in the world. And so how are we going to invest and grow these, uh, these assets? And it's very important uh, to change perceptions because uh, a core ele element of racism is is viewing people and, and, and denying the value of people so that they can be exploited. And, and, and by correcting it every time, we are, we are not only affirming uh, uh, the respect uh, given to people, but we're also unleashing some tremendous amount of energy and potential uh, when these people um, fully engage with our economic resources and with society. How does 1.4 trillion break down? About 25 billion in income uh, that's fueling the e retail and economic engine and the renters and uh, the Alana renters every month put in $175 million in monthly rental payments uh, into the Minnesota economy. There are 45,000 plus businesses with 7 billion in sales and this is 2012 data. Um, there is a, about half a million workers, and if you estimate their lifetime earnings, uh, that's an asset base of 1.4 trillion. Uh, there are people in the schools and universities uh, with, uh, um, they represent a 1.5 trillion in asset in, in human capital. There's 3 billion in annual taxes uh, in state and local taxes. And then we have uh, that these communities combine uh, uh, offer to the community and then the global and cultural assets that they uh, offer Minnesota to become a globally competitive place uh, to, um, uh, to, uh, to operate and, and have a business. Um, 
by the way, all these numbers are, that I, I, I produce are based on the economic, from the census data. Um, I use some very traditional numbers. They tend to be underestimates because I want to make sure that that whatever data I show can be verified um, by virtue of uh, um, um, anybody because they are Uncle Sam's numbers. Uh, another important asset, uh, by the way, I am not uh, ab able to look at the chat, so I'm, I'm not monitoring what questions are there, but I could come to that later too. Uh, if you look at another important asset that the Carolina communities are offering is that uh, it's a young, community, a young workforce, a lot of youth. And these youth represent future workers, future taxpayers, care for our seniors. They are people that keep our schools and universities going. If, if these students disappeared from our schools and universities, the educational system in Minnesota will collapse. And these people with their talent and the skills are what's going to make Minnesota globally competitive. So a strategy, uh, change, as change way is a, a change uh, the perceptions to view these communities of assets, keep a focus on people, on the impact of programs on people. And so we should typically offer a portfolio of services that can unleash this energy off on people. So not only giving people a fish, but teaching them how to fish, expanding the capacity to fish, providing a space to fish, helping them invent a new fish and ultimately transforming the fishing industry. We need to have these portfolio of services in the state and to measure their impact for the Alana communities, we need to have some very specific strategies and metrics that will assess ultimately the impact of people uh, at the base. Cultural intelligence is another important uh, uh, area that has a lot of significance. For instance, this data uh, shows the uh, um, the breakdown in educational attainment by disaggregated way. So within the Native American community, within the Asian community, within the Latino community, within the Black community, there's considerable differences. And as a policymaker, we've got to understand what are these differences, what causes these differences, and what's the appropriate remedy, whether it is a workforce, whether it's business, whether it's education, whether it's childcare, uh, whether it's any of our programs, we need to operate with cultural intelligence because that's going to also give us some clues. What is the most effective strategy? Uh, for instance, a strategy focused on female headed households and poverty might be a very effective economic development strategy. Uh, then we uh, look at issues of empowerment and uh, a framework that I offer of looking at these different environments uh, from the social environment, the economic environment, the personal environment, the institutional environment, and empowering the individual and the community to have liberation in all these areas so that they can transform the economic, social institutions and resources to build community wealth and attain the shared sustainable prosperity. One of the interesting facts is, uh, and I know it for a fact because uh, in, in the last two decades, I went before the judicial panel on redistricting and offered testimony. And the last testimony uh, behind me were a group of people called oneamend.org. Uh, and and uh, this group actually developed a redistricting map from the perspective of, of minorities. Uh, what happens when the chickens draw the map instead of the foxes, so to speak. Uh, so uh, we, uh, I testified before the, the judicial panel and said, uh, here's a map of economic interest of the Alana communities. Uh, here's what we think we could get in terms of rep representation. We challenged the judicial uh, uh, panel to come up with, 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 statistics, with, with representation of these economic interests. And when they did come up with a map, they were slightly better in terms of representation than we proposed. And so I had the opportunity to meet one of these judges uh, some years later and thank them for the map. And the judge said, oh, I remember your testimony. The point I'm trying to make is that, that, that this e economic uh, and political representation, the Alana communities have had a role in, in helping frame these economic interests. And so, uh, we have to uh, 
make sure that these interests are, are uh, properly um, uh, uh, reflected uh, because uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, constant, for constitutional reasons and other reasons. So when we Dr. look at- uh, Dr. Corey, yes. um, I just wanted to interrupt you for a moment. We've got a hand raised. Uh, oh. Representative uh, Ertl? Oh, uh, oh, there you go. Well, now you're muted again, Representative Erdahl. Hey you now? Yes, can hear you now. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Corey, I just want to uh, one of your early comments uh, <clears throat> talk education discrimination. And I'm wondering what you think is the most practice in education. Uh, uh, could you please repeat it? I didn't hear. What is the most? What is the most discriminatory practice? Oh, okay, okay. Uh, another way of, of, of answering that question is that if, if, if I were to say what's going to be help uh, the Alana student the most, I would say affordable education. So uh, getting access to, uh, to education in terms of cost. The second thing would be in terms of a culturally intelligent learning environment. So when I'm learning economics and when I'm learning science and technology, uh, can we have, can I see the experience or can I understand the experience from uh, my uh, uh, background, right? Uh, the support services for students. Uh, for example, uh, I know for a fact that, that contact with a professor can make a big difference because the professor has now a personal understanding, a personal relationship with you and can help the future uh, of, of, uh, of um, it. So uh, one of the failures of our system would be to look at accountability and graduation rates and, and, and career uh, placements because ultimately that's what's preventing the student from achieving success. Uh, I hope that answers in some ways your question. Representative Erdahl, any follow-up? Would you be a little more specific? The barriers to achieving success that you just said? Dr. Corey? Yeah, uh, Representative Richardson. So uh, one would be the financial ability uh, would be the first barrier. Uh, the second would be uh, the academic preparedness of the student because they are very often, they're coming from uh, poor academic um, backgrounds uh, in terms of the, their taking of AP classes and taking of, of uh, um, STEM education uh, classes to that effect. So, that, so these two factors uh, combine to give them a tougher, tougher challenge in, in, in doing well in the class. And then the third one would be the learning environment, the culturally learning environment of the, of the student. Okay, uh, thank you. Are you all, you're all done, Representative Erdahl? Yeah, I'm, I'm done, okay. thank you. Okay. okay, Dr. Corey, please proceed. So we are fortunate that we have 125 legislative districts with at least 100 million in Alana economic represent interest in each of them. And this does not include these, uh, the human talent uh, estimate. These are just the uh, income. I'm, I'm just looking at income. And so uh, uh, these uh, legislative districts in the House and the Senate have uh, people from all the parties involved. Um, and together, uh, they provide the necessary support and uh, and uh, and and representation uh, as we think about these strategies that are most effective in bringing uh, about change in 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 these communities. And so I've listed. I have these numbers for every legislative district uh, in in the state, and I've just identified uh, the top 125. Now, moving on to investments, what could we do in terms of investment? And, and one of the, as we came together uh, to deal with this crisis uh, of the pandemic, uh, the civil unrest and, 
and the economic decline uh, in the Solana Community Brain Trust, uh, our thinking is that every community should have some core economic infrastructure that would be good for wealth building. So there should be a community development corporation or a community development financial institution that has some technical expertise in business, real estate development, financial uh, uh, capacity. There should be business incubators, job boards, uh, legal finance and insurance uh, services. If you look at the people trying to recover from University Avenue and Lake Street, one of their biggest weaknesses is not having enough of legal and uh, insurance kind of advice. Uh, each one, uh, these district places could have land trusts that make uh, um, housing and commercial uh, uh, properties more, more affordable. The pictures about a commercial real estate land trust in Sel on Selby Avenue, which have a business down and an affordable housing on top. Uh, Co-ops, uh, financial asset building in order to uh, build uh, future wealth. Uh, people are debt, uh, uh, have their ha overcapacity in debt. So we got to think about equity funds. How could we invest in equity in the business? And uh, from the testimony of, of last week, uh, it'll be good also to have these community health clinic and wellness centers in these communities to, to help people uh, cope with many of the challenges, as well as uh, capacity for emergency shelter, food and energy. And you see that those are playing very uh, important roles in these crises. So, so a typical community should have access to these assets. So how do we get those assets? Some strategies uh, can be implemented with minimum cost. They need leadership and political will. For instance, uh, we could leverage our financial assets. We have millions sitting in, in banks, uh, in, uh, our deposits in banks. Can we bring them to the banks to the table to, to, to develop uh, an intentional uh, effort on growing Alana lending and financial assets? One of the insights of the PPP failure to reach the Alana communities in Minnesota was people did not have that relationship with the banker. And so when this program came out in a hurry, uh, the ones that had connected to the bank got the money, the ones that did not were not able to access that money. Uh, the state invests uh, in a lot of things as part of their investment portfolio. Could a fraction of that investment invest in community investment notes, for instance, that could support land trusts. So these will be revenue generating investments that would be part of the state's investment strategy. The state also has this huge financial pool that fraction of it could be leveraged to offer guarantees. A, a banker told me how important uh, the, the state guarantee, the deed guarantee was to his bank uh, to get out those PPP loans in a very rapid way. And so all the state was doing was guaranteeing uh, the, the due diligence that the bank was doing. We could leverage public spending. Uh, we just came out of a big bonding bill. Uh, how could that be leveraged to grow uh, businesses? Remember, we have two statutes in the books, state statute 16C and section three of HUD uh, that passed a new uh, reminded us last week. So we need to invest in capacity uh, of these Alana businesses and workforce so they can be successful in the project. In the project, Sometimes the rules and regulations serve as a barrier for their success and for them getting in, involved. So how could we re, uh, provide exemptions for businesses under a certain level? Uh, not only should we provide opportunities, we prov should provide mentoring partnerships so the business grows from a $1 million business to a $10 million business in, in 10 years or five years uh, through this mentoring partnerships. We need to be very deliberate in setting goals as to what type of goals that uh, we want in workforce and, and uh, Kevin Lindsay uh, set the bar in terms of the workforce goals that become standard nowadays in, in contracting. Uh, in four sections three and section 16c and all public spending and then 
Oh, hi, Doc, uh, Dr. Corey. Sorry to interrupt you, but um, we have a member question. Representative Cagle. Thank you, Representative Richardson. I was just curious, Dr. Corey, what some what are some of the regulations that are rules that we could change? Um, you know, what are some of those barriers that that you see in those regulations and rules that could help um, some of the businesses and workforce? Dr. Corey, uh, Representative Richardson, uh, Representative Kriegel, thank you for the uh, the question. Um, one example would be. Uh, um, requirements uh, for uh, wage and labor uh, requirements that that are very important uh, because they uh, in the long haul good uh, good paying wages are what created the middle class but for very small businesses I would say say under a million dollars which are still struggling if they were to uh, uh, hire uh, um, and meet some of those requirements, they would not be competitive and they'd not be able to to take part, uh, to, to offer those, uh, uh, to uh, uh, compete. Uh, bonding requirements. Um, can we uh, develop a, a, a way in which uh, uh, we could have some facility that would meet those uh, bonding needs, but uh, reduce that burden on the small business? Uh, so those are two examples where um, I, that come to mind right away in terms of those rules and regulations. Representative Kegel, any follow up? Thank you, Dr. Corey. You can proceed. Thank you, Representative Richards. I, I just want to mention that uh, uh, the, the unions have played a very important role in in the development of of this country and and, and the workforce. And uh, research has found that. Uh, Alana workers and unions, uh, they benefited much more than uh, other workers just because of that higher income that they moved from a very low income to a high low income. So the labor uh, uh, agreements and, and, and good wages are an important part. I, I'm just asking for uh, suggesting a, a, an exemption at lower levels. And there could be a way in which the same responsibility is, is maintained, for instance, the small business is getting this exemption, but is investing in their workforce through some kind of uh, uh, loan or profit sharing component in, in their wages. So workers are getting benefit as this business is also growing. Um, so coming to um, uh, need to monitor uh, not only the progress, but also and workforce are growing over time. Uh, did this 100,000 business become a million dollar business through public spending and participating in this contract? We don't have that kind of information. And that's critically important information to show uh, this is not a one-time kind of a thing, but this is a consistent uh, program. Uh, some of the rules, uh, again, that we, um, uh, that I talked about would be um, in the area of housing could be zoning, as we found in the video, um, uh, changing zoning to allow more density so that affordable housing can occur. Uh, some new communities um, need uh, larger household, uh, more rooms, for instance, uh, in, 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 uh, in the terms of their needs. Uh, the, what I mentioned about exempting businesses uh, for smaller businesses from certain rules and regulations, and then uh, streamlining paperwork and funding criteria. Sometimes to get a government program and get a government loan or a grant, it saves so much of paperwork that people say, oh, forget it, I, I don't want to get involved. And so how could we balance accountability with making it easy and accessible to access these programs? Uh, cultural intelligence and how we promote, how we offer, how we engage uh, is very important in terms of making sure that these programs are successful. We can also leverage our Congress, congressional delegation because the federal government has a tremendous amount of resources that are- that Dr. Corey? Be yes? Uh, before you get into the slide, I see a hand was just raised. Uh, Co-Chair Moran? Yes, thank you, Chair uh, Richardson. Um, 
Dr. Cora, did you go back to the last slide that you just had up? And um, just for, you know, because cultural intelligence is not easily understandable, could you kind of like explain what that is again for thank, us? Thank you very much. And I think um, the, the different cultures uh, um, um, relate differently uh, to, um, uh, for instance, some people may not look at you in the eye when they talk, or some people um, might um, uh, have an experience, a negative experience with government. And so getting connected with government in any form is, uh, is really troublesome. Sometimes people don't realize that their program is there for them and they can access it. They think it's not there for them. Uh, sometimes the way it's the language. So in the PPP program, uh, there's all this paperwork that a business owner had to understand, but it was all in English. And because of COVID, uh, nonprofits didn't have the ability to go knock at the door of the person's home uh, or business and show them and help them with the paperwork and so they would not know what to fill in, what kind of forms to submit. Uh, and so you found as people were learning about it, uh, cities like Minneapolis and St. Paul and the state began to offer multiple language uh, translations and, and resources to help them better access those programs. Uh, so understanding, as I mentioned the earlier statistics, that if you were to say, a broad category. So Asians are doing very well. So they don't know, uh, they don't need any uh, uh, any uh, attention, but you got to break it down and see it. Maybe it's the Asian Indians that are doing well and not the Karen. Uh, and so that's the cultural intelligence you get when you engage with the communities uh, across different cultures. Uh, did that help? Co-chair oh, Moran? Yes, uh, Madam Chair. And so um, maybe I'm not going to, you know, um, so when you look at cultural intelligence uh, in, the, in the business arena uh, or like for entrepreneur or a small business owner of color, and you have where at some point at very low levels where we have invested in, for example, a neighborhood development center, which is there to like cultures, you know, that, that entrepreneur into the business arena to be able to mentor them, but coach them and give them the small loan that they may need to start a business that the bank otherwise would not have given them. But recognizing not only there could be a, 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 a language barrier, but the institution of racism or how we see these communities could also be the barrier to access that um, when we think about like changing the rules and regulations we are looking at how would that look like for these diverse communities who are great business people, who are the entrepreneurs, who want to be that small business owner and then creating those pathways to make it possible for that to happen. Can we kind of like insert that under that, do you think under that cultural intelligence piece as ways that, you know, we at the state level can be um, open Dr. Corey. Representative Richardson, Representative Moran, uh, you are very right. Uh, Minnesota is a pioneer in ethnic-based business assistance and business development, pioneered by uh, Mike Tamale, Ramon Leon, and other people in the communities where, uh, where, where training is given in the language of the people and resources uh, are. So again, when you, when you have a program like this, you know that certain communities uh, it's difficult to take a loan. So you've got to offer a product with some kind of a profit sharing or a fee-based instrument. And if you don't do it, you're leaving out a whole uh, group of, 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 of very, very uh, dynamic entrepreneurs. Uh, and so I did a very detailed study of African immigrants. Uh, and so realized also about differences uh, in, in the African immigrant community and how, uh, how, uh, how uh, programs, many of them uh, don't know any of uh, what these programs are and how they could access it. 
the way we were effective uh, when I was at the city of St. Paul was our team actually went down to these businesses, sat down with them and helped them fill up application forms. And because of my team did that, they got access to loans they would have never, or grants they would have never have heard about. Uh, but it, it takes some, uh, sometimes the cultural intelligence is a smile and a welcoming uh, approach uh, uh, to make people welcome, to encourage them to, to that, that this is for them, uh, like everybody else, and, and, and the, the government uh, serves them and not the other way around. And the flip side of also cultural intelligence is when, the, when uh, we launched this strategy of economic development focusing on cultural assets. So can you come to this African or restaurant or go to Rondo and, and, and have this experience about a taste of Rondo? So how can a business become a cultural destination? And as that businesses attract people who want that experience, they grow wealthy and the community around benefits through jobs and, and economic uh, growth in that area. So culture has been a very untapped, uh, undertapped resource, both in terms of how we better deliver a service, as well as how we could tap into this energy that's so vibrant in these communities. Um, um, and then sometimes uh, uh, people might not understand a cultural idea. For instance, uh, uh, lipstick, for example. Uh, if there's a shade of lipstick that is not generally available in, in the communities, I remember going to Mercado Central with my wife and she found these particular colors that were only available out there. Uh, but you take that to a banker and say, I wanna make um, lipstick. And the banker will say, hey, the market is saturated. There's nothing, there's nothing. they don't understand the idea, right? So it takes, uh, understanding the business idea is a big challenge that uh, many entrepreneurs face because the cultural backgrounds of both the people are different. They can't see that other dimension. And you can only see it by immersing yourself in communities and building networks. Yeah, and so Madam Chair, just to close with this, is that, you know, uh, Dr. Corey, one of the things that I liked additional that you said that sometime in, in the business world and dealing with government, sometimes it's just a smile, right? That is that connection um, especially with communities, a lot of communities that sometimes do not believe that government is for them, that government is on their side, who sometimes believe that government has like left them out, you know, through the processes, through the regulations, through the overburden of regulations sometimes. Um, uh, and, and so um, when you have a process where a, a line of folks and you have went through all this work to it, to get information from them. And when we don't respond to any of those recommendations, we see what we continue to see, which is an abundance of, you know, disparities that is just not working for all, but it's definitely working for some. Um, so uh, I just wanna thank you for that. I just wanted to go back, you know, just get some, deeper dive a little bit deeper around the culture intelligence that's not about whether or not someone is smart enough or not um that is not the the, the question here under that it is more about how um, who are developing culture intelligence in the public sector uh, i would say also in in in, in, in uh, yeah in work that we do at the state level for sure but yes thank, thank you. you thank you madam chair thank you co-chair moran um, uh, it looks like we have a question from Representative Birdall. Uh, yes, uh, you mentioned, uh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Corey, um, you mentioned uh, the connecting with the government. Wondering <clears throat> if you believe that, that fostering a better understanding of how our government works would be culturally and economically beneficial. Dr. Corey. Uh, uh, Chair uh, Richardson, and, and I, I want to respond uh, in both ways uh, to what Representative Moran said and, and what uh, Representative Rodell just asked. I want to give you an example from last week. There were 60 people and we lost a few because they couldn't wait, but they waited for three hours. And I particularly remember the last testimony because I know that person. Uh, she waited three hours, an African immigrant entrepreneur 
had a lot of uh, bad experiences with predatory lending. She didn't know how to use Zoom. Uh, so uh, she had called me and I showed her how to use Zoom so that when her time came to speak that she could turn on. And she had a little difficulty, if you remember, when, when she her time came up. Uh, so here's the challenges of co government connecting to people, right? What we might think is obvious is not so obvious. It requires a little bit more engagement and connection. And so, Representative Ordell, uh, about uh, connecting with government, uh, it's it's that relationship with the, uh, I remember uh, a representative once told me is, why are people not coming to me uh, for these issues? Uh, we can be a champion. And I said, it's the relationship. When I was the director of planning economic development, one of the most common things I would hear from people was, hey, is this the first time the leader has come to my community or come to my chamber or come to my business or come? And I would think I was not doing something exceptional. This was what I'm supposed to do, right? So how could, how could we break those barriers that we don't have to go to the state capital and, and deal with all those kinds of things to get there. How could we make it easier for the connection between the people to people, people to institutions? And that will be a big asset when people know that their relationship and their access, uh, they're going to, they're going to uh, really improve. Uh, did that answer your question, Representative Verdal? Um, Representative Verdal. Chair, well, my, my point is that you know, how, how can relationships if uh, there is not a firm understanding of how government works. Oh, I'm, a big, I'm a big civics advocate, Dr. Corey. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, Representative Richardson, the, the, the image that comes to my mind, uh, Representative Erdahl, is going to a caucus in, in Ward 1 in St. Paul. And I found that room full of people, African immigrants, and many of them were dressed in traditional garbs that when, when you would look at, uh, if you have an image of, 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 uh, of people, hey, do they understand American systems and American government structures? And I was so uh, inspired by them because they were sitting there from about, I don't know, whatever, six hours or whatever time that, that, that action had to be taken in terms of the democratic process. Uh, but they sat there and they engaged and they voted and they spoke and they so they know a lot about uh, the basic elements of representative uh, democracy. Uh, they need uh, to have more avenues in which they can participate, and you can see that showing up in the voter uh, uh, voter participation rates by ethnic groups. Uh, the ones that are more engaged, you have very high. Uh, rates of uh, uh, voting and, and, and participation like that. So yes, it's going to be a two-way street. There, there's always room to education, uh, to educate people, but also people are willing to learn. And you can see how they are learning very fast. Just look at the representation in the Minnesota legislature today and the diversity on it, and everybody who's on the ground will know how quickly people are learning how American systems work. How does a caucus work? How do you get delegates? And how I need to get those delegates in order to get uh, elected? And how do I strike partnerships? So yes, it's a, a, it's, a, it's a very dynamic process and possible. Representative Erdahl, any follow-up? Uh, no, I think that, that answers it. I, I think it's important that we have a firm knowledge and how the system works so that we can. Uh, Representative Erdahl, we're losing your audio, but I think you're saying that we need a firm knowledge on civics. I'm yes. Okay. All right. Thank you, Representative Erdahl. Uh, we have another question. Uh, Representative uh, becker -Fenn. Uh Thank you, Madam Chair and uh, Dr. Corey. And I I think this is maybe a good example uh, for folks who, who are watching this. And I, I wanted to share this example with you is we, we had passed a bill uh, last year 
to fund a, a small grant program to get more kids outdoors. And um, it was something that I was really passionate about. And we, we worked really closely with the DNR to make the grant application as simple as possible um, with the idea that we didn't want that to be a barrier to folks um, being able to apply. And what I what I found working with the with the Department of Natural Resources staff is that they were well intentioned, but maybe hadn't thought of that before. And so um, by having those conversations and putting in a little extra work, we ended up with so many people and so many different groups um, applied for those those mini grants that we actually had to stop taking applications. Um, by the afternoon of that day. And I think part of that was that it didn't need to be sent to some different department to figure out how to fill out the application. You know, we were able to make that really simple. And then we also had a phone number that people could call if they didn't understand the application so that a staff person right. could help walk them through it um, if they were new to filling out the application. So I, I just wanted to share that with folks as sort of an, um, an example of making things, you know, sort of that streamlining the paperwork and making it easier for people to figure it out um, so that they can they can access the program. Thank you, Rep. Becker Finn. Uh, Dr. Corey, not really a question, but did you want to respond to that at all before you move on to the next question? Uh, thank you, Representative Richardson, and thank you, uh, Representative Baker Finn. Uh, Becker Finn, uh, you were right. Uh, 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 that can make a big difference, just making it simple, easier to access and accessible to communities. Um, uh, and, and that'll take a little work. It reminded me about uh, investments that the state need made in DNR, maybe about 20 years ago, to hire conservation officers from the Southeast Asian community. Uh, unfortunately, the numbers didn't increase in terms of conservation officers. I believe they're still... Dr. Corey, it looks like we may have lost audio. Okay, we will see if we cannot get connected with Dr. Corey behind the scenes to see if he can be reconnected to his audio. As we are waiting, oh, yeah, looks like we lost him completely now. So we will wait for him to try to re-enter the room. And happy to open it up to other comments that members may have if there are other comments that members would want to make right now while we're waiting for Dr. Corey, you can just use the hand raise function. Uh, Representative Sandell. Thank you, Chair Richardson. Uh, um, most of um, the comments that, that Dr. Corey has mentioned and, and um, uh, many of the questions that we've had deals with government uh, taking some responsibility and taking some leadership. But it seems to me to be uh, uh, particularly effective. We've got to be able to uh, uh, find a way to um, um, provide incentives uh, for the, the, the private sector, private banks, private uh, investors, private uh, contractors. Um, and uh, uh, as a DFLer, I, I, I'm often um, encouraged to look at government and look at government initiative. But I know that uh, in order to get something done, we've got to find a way to uh, satisfy those who are maybe less interested in government leadership and, and uh, want more uh, um, private leadership. So how do we find this public-private uh, 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 relationship and how do we uh, um, find a way to uh, uh, get corporations and, and companies and private interests to uh, uh, take the initiative? I, I know the, the, the real incentive, of course, is profit for those people, but um, uh, how, how, how do we go about that? How do we go about getting private investors to take initiative and, and uh, 
maybe not seek the the, the greatest profit, but uh, some profit in their in their uh, uh, efforts. Uh, thank you, Rep. Sandell, for your question. And Representative Her, my apologies. I will get to you next um, with your uh, with your question as well. But Dr. Corey, uh, coming back to you, welcome back. Uh, the joys of technology. So um, we appreciate you logging back in. Um, I don't know if you wanted to wrap up your comments related to Rep. Becker Finn's uh, piece, and Rep. Sandell has also put forth a, a question related to uh, private uh, participation. Uh, uh, thank you, Chair Richardson. I'm sorry. It looks like I, we lost power here, and that's why I'm I'm logged onto my iPhone uh, uh, to to get back. So I may have missed a little bit uh, of what uh, what was said. Uh, but uh, so you noticed my background is fitting with uh, Representative Beckerfin's statement about uh, net nature <laughs> because I, I have to log in from a different system. So if you notice something different, that's the reason uh, uh, I'm, I'm using my iPhone. So, so I, I didn't have much to add uh, to that, uh, but I, what is the other question? Um, so uh, Rep Sandal, would you be able to summarize your question here uh, quickly? Sure. In addition to government initiative, what about uh, finding ways to um, uh, offer incentives for private sector to uh, uh, provide some of these services and, and support that we need uh, in order to uh, uh, integrate or I guess uh, um, encourage uh, um, investment in a um, uh, um, variety of communities that need the help. Dr. Corey. Uh, Chair Richardson, uh, uh, Representative, that's a great question about uh, public-private partnerships. I think the answer is going to lie there. And and over the past few months, we've been engaging on that question with the Alana Brain Trust, with the Federal Reserve Bank, with with uh, with bankers, with uh, uh, congressional delegations. Uh, and one way that that uh, state can help these public-private partnerships is by using the leverage that it has. So, for example, I, I gave the case about loan guarantees. So in a loan guarantee, all that the government is doing is providing a guarantee, but the banks are the one that are putting their capital and their assets in uh, serving and lending to the community. So you are then unleashing this vast private capital to serve this community good. Similarly for corporations and, and other entities, there could be ways in which uh, uh, we could we could take uh, the the uh, the leverage of the state and uh, unleash a lot of other potential in different areas. So there's a lot of potential there. Representative Sandell. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Representative Her. Thank you, uh, Chair Richardson. And it's good to see you again, Dr. Corey. It's been a while. Um, your presentation today was really great. I do just want to say real quick that, you know, to Representative Erdahl's point, I think that civics is really important, but I think that we have to remember that get, being knowing how the civic process work actually doesn't give you access. And you know, I'm somebody who is you know, speaks English, I think pretty well, and I am educated in America and I have graduate degrees and yet understanding how our civic process work actually didn't give me any access that I didn't even know until I became a legislator that the state capital was free and open and it belonged to me. And so when you aren't brought up in those concepts, you can know the specifics of a structure, but if you're never told that that structure belongs to you and that you have a voice in that structure, it doesn't matter. That knowledge actually isn't very helpful. So I, so I think that it's really important for us to remember how social and cultural capital plays into people's access and really for us to think about how we dismantle the way we do structures here that actually prevent people from coming into these spaces. And how do we decide that we won't be sitting in our offices and waiting for people who have the most access, like lobbyists and companies to come to us? And that how, if we are representative of other people, how do we show up in community with people to actually hear directly from them, to actually gather uh, feedback from them directly? How do we do this differently? Because the structure, the way it's set up, is it gives the same people the same access all the time. And those who don't have access don't have the ability to, to, um, to operate in that system. Uh, what I would maybe just like Dr. Cord to just talk a little bit about is that, um, you know, like some like there's such intersectionality between all these uh, different um, structures and systems that set up, right? Like we, um, 
he talked about the economic systems. He talked about, you know, just access to financial mar to, to markets, to all these different things. And I wondered if there is a way for us to think more from this from intersectionality approach, because if somebody doesn't have housing security, they can't even think about, you know, starting a business and being able to access that or um, you know, if they don't have um, the education that they need and we're not doing what we're supposed to, that they don't have the opportunity then to even get to a higher, to, to get a, you know, a graduate degree or, or an undergraduate degree and then be able to start thinking about what does it mean for them to build credit to even be a part of some of these markets. And so I wondered if maybe he could talk a little bit to um, how we might try to solve some of these problems looking at it intersection, uh, intersectionally. And then also just the really simple question of, the one thing I hear the most from people when we talk about programs, right, like the disconnect, I hear us go out into community and say, and we allocated $10 million to this thing. And the community is like, How come? we had no idea. And we don't know what that thing is. And no one ever told us about that thing. And here we're touting all the great things that we're doing and where we're allocating money. But the people who really need it have no idea what we've done. They have no idea where to go get access to those programs. They have no idea how to access those resources. And what are ways in which we could do a better job of not just doing this work, but actually making sure community knows that the work exists and how they can get access to it. Dr. Corey. Dr. Corey, you're still muted. Okay, now can you hear me? Yes, we're able to hear you yeah. now. Yeah, uh, thank you, uh, Representative, uh, Chair Richardson and uh, Representative Herb. Uh, it's nice to see you too. Uh, and. Uh, uh, your point about the intersectionality is so relevant and it's one of the fundamental insights uh, I learned over the years. And that's what behind, uh, behind the, uh, the, the policy mandala diagram I showed, that we need to look at all these different elements and, and how they're connected. And, and maybe we'll have the ability uh, soon to be able to understand, say, if we, if, if we focus on people in public housing, for instance, uh, what are the resources that they are accessing? What are they not accessing? And so how could you fill in the gaps? So how could you layer programs so that uh, they, they move out of that situation? And I think uh, with big data and with big uh, our new capabilities, we'll be closer to be able to see those connections and reinforce and, and, uh, and add value uh, to existing programs. Representative Herr, any follow-up? Thank you. It looks like we have Representative Cagle up next with a question. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, so I was going back to the housing discrimination slide and um, just kind of curious about if there's any reasons why minorities pay higher rates. Um, Going through a loan process for a home myself um, recently, you know, I didn't even talk to a lender um, face to face for quite a while. And so just kind of curious about um, if there's a way to do like blind lending. Um, you've heard stories about when they take names off of resumes that, um, you know, it, it differentiates people less. And so I um, was wondering if you know, how, how do we get to the root of why some of that housing discrimination happens and then how can we make it so that um, it doesn't? Dr. Corey. Chair, uh, Representative, uh, thank you for that question. Uh, the, the nature and to, to investigating, investigate uh, uh, discrimination and lending is extremely complex and it's extremely Hard. And so you have these complex models that people try to use to look at that question. And so there's an academic debate on the magnitude and, and so on of, of, of this discrimination. But it does exist in, in different rates. Uh, and, and I believe uh, Dr. Myers locally has done some research uh, that when you factor in all these different variables, there's still some factors that are unexplained. Uh, and that's where these racial elements would come in. Uh, so, um, um, so, so the, the idea is can machine uh, tools be better in uh, reducing it? And I believe some of those online lending groups are better at that because they're going with certain uh, algorithms uh, to uh, assess it. But 
I, I'm not fully uh, aware of where the latest research on, is on that, whether they are absolutely better or how, 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 how much have they reduced the differences in, in uh, this gap. Representative Cagle, any follow-up? Okay. Um, Representative Moran, um, Co-Chair Moran, you have a question? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. So in regards to Representative Cagle's question, uh, I, I first want us to, to, to remind us all that we are on a select committee on racial justice, and we're talking about racism. And so there have been policies that have been created that are called barriers that gets in the way. And we have had policies that says, well, we want to know your credit rating. We want to know whether or not you're paying your bills on time. We want to know what community that you live in currently. We want to know how long you've been on your job. What is your annual income? Have you been incarcerated? All those factors come into play on you know, whether or not you're going to be, uh, have a, a, a higher, uh, whether or not you're going to pay a higher rate. Based on all those factors that government has laid out on decision making about who gets the credit or who do not get credit and what is those stipulations to that process. It is within those inequities that we continue to see that continues to be expanded, that keeps in removing people right, those opportunities and those possibilities from happening. Um, and it, it, it doesn't, you know, often we know it doesn't even matter if you are educated or not educated because it's the color of your skin that becomes the barrier to access, comes to the barrier of whether or not you will get that opportunity or not, or your language. And so those are factors that bears to when we see those inequities happening, it is because of the policies and practices that have been put in place by government. Thank, thank you, Co-Chair Moran. And one thing that I would just add to that too, going back to the very first hearing that we had as part of this committee uh, with Dr. Jones, one of the uh, things that she highlighted in terms of the challenge to addressing systemic racism is that it's oftentimes uh, it's it's been implemented as part of policies of discretion. And so when you look, for example, at uh, appraisals and the recent research that came out where there have been um, very specific cases of homes being appraised at much lower values when it's an identified um, African-American uh, versus when all uh, sort of remnants of the color of who owns the home, um, it, it's uh, we've actually seen that the homes have been appraised at higher prices. And we're not talking about $10,000 or $20,000 more. Uh, in the case of some of the recent um, uh, studies that were done, it was over $100,000. There was over a $100,000 difference in terms of looking at that appraisal. And so um, as we, you know, one of the challenges that we face is oftentimes within the discretion, because if you're looking at an algorithm that says, if it's this, this, and this, regardless, everyone gets sort of the, the, the same thing. What we know is that that's not the way that our lending uh, uh, is actually working um, in practice. And we also have the challenges I think faced with like learning from about like redlining as well and really identifying how some of these things that may not seem to be problematic on the face that when you actually look at the history of how we are getting to um, uh, identifying property values makes it problematic with the historical lens in terms of how we got to identifying what's a valuable property versus what's not um, as valuable. Dr. Corey, anything that you'd like to add to that? I know that we are coming up on about 10 minutes here and yes. we did not get through all of your slides. So I want to uh, be cognizant of whether you had any uh, key points from the other slides. And I'll also ask staff to pull up the slideshow right now on behalf of Dr. Corey in case there's uh, some closing comments that he has. Yeah, so you could, move, thank you, Chair uh, Richardson. You could move forward on the slide. Uh, so our congressional delegation and uh, Senator Tina Smith and Congressman 
uh, Dean Phillips have already been working uh, to uh, on some very uh, uh, some co-sponsoring bills that are before Congress right now. For instance, how could we leverage the power of the Federal Reserve Bank? Uh, recently, in the PPP program, they served uh, operated a lending facility that banks then were able to lend out more money to small businesses that needed help. Can we institutionalize that and with a focus on the Alina businesses by changing, uh, by statutory changes in the, in the Federal Reserve Bank legislation? Similarly, in these other organizations like the Small Business Administration, HUD, uh, and the CDFI fund, there could be ways in which more capital and accessible capital comes to our communities. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, go next slide. Uh, here is a, is a big idea. A $1 billion economic uh, development bond fund, and we've been exploring this uh, with, with the Federal Reserve Bank and other institutions too. Uh, but if the state of Minnesota I, might be more uh, uh, appropriate where this happens, where uh, you can uh, uh, float this bond fund in, in different forms that goes into uh, business development, housing, uh, workforce development. And these bonds uh, 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 would be backed by the state of Minnesota. So the question would be, where would uh, we fund the bonds? And if you move to the next slide. So, uh, uh, as we know, seen in the slides that uh, the redlining and the mortgage industry and the financial industry has been the source of uh, this uh, gaps in the financial uh, lit, uh, financial uh, assets of, of the Alana communities, especially the black community. So if you look at last year, uh, there were about 50,000 uh, plus uh, homes that were sold in the Twin Cities with the value, I think, about uh, 16 billion or so. And if you just have a tax of 1% on that financial uh, transaction, that in turn can generate a stream of revenue that could fund the bonds. And so uh, it, is, it, it is a remedy that's, that, that's uh, um, um, uh, based on uh, these historic uh, patterns in, this, in our community. So uh, yeah, there could be other ways of funding this, uh, the, the bond sales, but here's uh, one, uh, one, one, uh, one way that I suggest. And finally, to close, uh, uh, what we have done is we have formed uh, this Alana Community, the next slide, uh, we have formed this Alana Community Brain Trust. This is a group of people with expertise in how to develop land trust, how to develop uh, a business incubator, how to uh, uh, manage a real development project. And uh, we want to have this resource ready so that when, uh, because one of the biggest gaps in our community is the gaps in capital and the gaps in capacity. And so this brain trust, this collection of people with expertise who could uh, offer uh, their talents in, in, when, when in the operation and funding uh, uh, execution of projects that might come up and so far has been very effective. For instance, recently, we, uh, we were able to uh, uh, connect resources for youth across uh, Minnesota through this network. So I'll end my slide there. I know there, there are the time is running out, but uh, I can just keep it open for further questions or any comments. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, members of the committee. Thank you, Dr. Corey, for your presentation and putting a lot of information into a really digestible presentation for us. I know that there has been a lot of work that has gone into this and appreciate you calling our attention to a number of different resources out there that include recommendations for uh, for the committee to consider as well. I am not seeing any further questions questions. So I'll just make sure that no hands come up. And not seeing any other questions, I will call on Vice Chair Damis. Thank you, Co-Chair Richardson. I appreciate the opportunity. Dr. Corey, thank you for your presentation. Thank you very much for the information that was shared. Um, to hear about the gaps so clearly in the 
uh, income, housing, education, um, also that need in the business community for more financial, legal, and insurance um, training and understanding and much more. Thank you again for that testimony. Very, very helpful. I also like the idea that you came forth with solutions. It's one thing to hear about the issues, but then to have some solutions that could potentially be considered is very helpful, so thank you. I would like to um, recommend the, I appreciate um, Co-Chair Richardson, I appreciate the opportunity that we had to watch as a group, the Jim Crow of the North, the documentary, and thank you for showing that. I would recommend that everyone would finish that. I've seen that in the past and it's incredibly helpful right here in our own state to understand some of the things that were done. Um, I would also like to thank, going back to the testifiers last week, their powerful testimony that we heard um, and how it again ties in to this, this meeting, this committee hearing today. Um, they shared their personal impacts of systemic racism and also identified, again, those concrete steps that the legislature could take to address some of the issues. We did hear numerous testimony and testifiers stressed the need for more teachers of color, um, possibly with re repealing the last in first out provisions that are too common in our public schools and expanding real opportunities through school choice. These insightful recommendations will be helpful as we look at ways to remove the barriers to opportunities in education, in healthcare, in housing, in business, our economic impact and fairness in the criminal justice system. We need to restore trust in various systems and my hope is that we together as a, commi as a committee can start to lay the groundwork for developing sustainable solutions that will address these racial injustice areas. And again, thank you for the work that's being done. Thank you, Vice Chair Damoth. Uh, Co-Chair Moran. Thank you, Madam Chair. I will be really, really short. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Dr. Corey for your presentation together. Very informational, very detailed. Um, and the re recommendations, of course, were great. So thank you for that. Uh, I just want to also just recognize uh, and reiterate what I just heard what Mrs. Damon uh, say about the, the 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 movie, the presentation we heard, of, um, uh, the present the, the movie that we just uh, was able to uh, watch as we open up this hearing. To please go back and, and look at that again and take in the uh, injustices that we heard that was intentional, that were created. Um, and those inequities, those uh, racial bias, that those discriminations that we heard are still a part of who we are today. They are still there embedded in policies, right? And so, just take a peek at that and look at that and see as legislators, what does I do diligence to do, to be open to expanding not only our own personal knowledge, not only our own personal knowledge, but a knowledge that we need to impart with our constituencies across the state of Minnesota that will see its way into laws in policies and practices in the 21st century. Um, it's, it's sometimes hard for me to take in this information. It's, it's educational, something that none of us learned in school. Somehow it was missing from civics. It wasn't there. And so we are adding some additional civics, some uh, additional education into our own world that was not there, that we did not, that was not captured in any of our school settings, not even in mines. And I grew up in a black community with many black teachers. I probably learned a little bit more than you did, right? Because it was a part of my educational system. But that intentionality was left out. And so we have lots to learn, right? To create a more equitable and fair outcome to where we see huge disparities within our, our line of communities. So we can do better, we can be better, and we can be a legislature that is not just known by are uh, huge disparities for well, a legislature that is working on those disparities to create better outcomes for all. And so I uh, would just stop there and say thank you, Madam Speaker, for uh, uh, your I'm work not today. Speaker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I, I just want to thank everyone for participating in these uh, this series of informational uh, hearings. I know it's been a lot of information coming at you. Um, and it's been heavy information coming at you as well. And as we talked about at the start of this series of informational hearings, these conversations can be difficult and we know that they're difficult because there's something that's deeply wrong. If there was nothing wrong, these would not be difficult conversations uh, to have. And what we have really been able to do in these last few weeks is to really begin to look at um, not only identifying the issue, but really understanding how to measure some of the issues as well. Uh, we heard some of the impact today when we're thinking about uh, racism as an economic, uh, as the economic impacts of racism and what that is costing not only our economy here in Minnesota, but also looking at what those estimates are nationally as, as well. And Dr. Corey, I really appreciate you being able to put a Minnesota lens um, on this conversation today because it's so important to understand how it's impacting uh, our, our communities. But we've also heard from a healthcare perspective and looking at the maternal child and infant uh, outcomes. We have black women that are three to four times more likely to die during pregnancy and childbirth. And when you can control for all the variables, housing, you know, education, uh, socioeconomic status, um, insurance, and even looking at general overall health and well-being, we see that Black women are three to four times more likely to die when, when you control for all those variables. And Black infants are twice as likely to die before their first birthday. So we've, we've talked about things from an educational perspective, including the um, opportunity gap. We've talked about ACEs, and we've also talked about uh, the school discipline disparities that make it really difficult for our kids to reach uh, developmental milestones. If the kids are not even in school, it's hard to keep up with the curriculum and to be able to stay on track with graduating on time and what we see for those kids who are being pushed out. Oftentimes, they're at higher risk of not graduating. And when we talk about the, uh, the preschool to prison pipeline, that is something that is really real. So I appreciate all of you sticking with us over the last several uh, weeks. Thank and you. we are looking forward to uh, pulling together all of the recommendations that have come through. Um, and there have been recommendations at every hearing. Uh, some have been more focused on recommendations uh, through others than others, but um, we are looking forward to getting those all compiled to be able to come back to the full committee with uh, a list of uh, slate of recommendations for consideration. With that, with there being no other business before the committee, we will uh, now adjourn and enjoy the snow. <laughs>